Welcome to the One Zen Academy Fitness Podcast. Everything health, wellness, fitness and performance all under one roof. My name is Kieran. I've got over 15 years worth of experience within personal training, health, wellness and sports rehabilitation. For more information, go to www.onezenacademy.com. Thank you. Hi, welcome guys. Welcome to this uh, latest episode of the One Zen Fitness Academy podcast. My name is Kieran, as always. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, I run a, an academy where we train people to become personal trainers, sports therapists up to level four, soon to be level five, and yoga practitioners. Uh, we also run CPD workshops. Um, and these are actual qualifications internationally recognized. But aside from that, the, the thing that actually pops up all the time, which I probably, as in this podcast, I need to address, um, are common training mistakes. So in the first weekend, we go, we dissect free weight exercises and we go through all the common mistakes. And what I've found with an increasing amount of people is how many students, how many people I see um, don't know this, what I consider to be common information. And obviously it's not so common. And it's incorrect uh, pushing and pulling techniques for the upper body. And that's where we'll kind of start this. There's a reason why when I train in the gym, I wear headphones. It's not to um, block the sensations of what I'm experiencing when I'm training. It's really to try and distract me away from the poor training uh, technique from a lot of people. And it's not a reflection on people in necessarily the the trainers or anything in the gym that I go to. I'm in the 6,000 members. Um, and I appreciate some people listen, uh, actually go to my gym, but, <laughs> but, um, all of this is said with love, by the way. Um, these common training mistakes as a, as, as someone who's had 15 years in sports rehabilitation, who, who does still see people, um, who come in with certain conditions that can be easily rectified or prevented. I think this needs to be common knowledge and needs to be said. So on that note, I'm going to start life with one of the, the biggest, and this isn't just a common mistake. This is a real pet hate of mine and I don't like using the word hate but this is it and it's behind the neck lat pull down now you will get a lot of resistance to this you'll get some people say no no it's it's fine it's fine to do it behind that pull down because that big guy in the gym has been doing it for years and he's fine my point always is he's just got away with it okay he's like the outlier the exception to the rule and I'm going to hopefully be able to explain why initially. We're then going to have a look at bent over row and bench press. Um, yes, people horrendously do the bench press incorrectly. I know that's hard to believe. Um, but let's start with behind the neck lat pull down. Uh, to appreciate why you shouldn't do it behind your head, uh, we need to look at the, the shoulder as a whole. And when we look at the shoulder, we we say words like glenohumeral joint. Um, So that's where your your humerus actually attaches itself into the glenoid fossa, which is this very shallow little area for the the ball to go into the socket. Uh, It's the weakest joint in the body, unfortunately. And yet we really load this joint, you know, for all it's worth. Now, unlike the hip, which is a ball and socket, but has a deep, a very deep socket and can take a lot of load bearing. Um, like I said, it's quite shallow. Um, and the, the, the reality is, and I think it was uh, Paul Check who used this analogy originally, which I, I love because in his words, he likes to oversimplify things and this was perfect. So try and picture a seal, okay? A seal balancing a ball on its nose. So the seal is the scapula, the nose is the the glenoid fossa, okay, and the ball itself is the humerus as it attaches into the shoulder, into that glenoid fossa, okay. Each part of that has to be able to move freely in order to balance the other. So try and picture that throughout all of what I'm about to say. 
So <clears throat> if I take my arm away, so let me give you a bit of actually a, 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 a breakdown of um, the, the movement and the terms that we might use, because I appreciate not everyone's familiar with these terms, uh, but I pre also appreciate some people are. So I uh, apologies if it bores you in advance. But if I take my arm, if my arm's by my side and I take it away from the midline of the body, we call this abduction, to abduct, to take away. Um, so take your arm up to 90 degrees of abduction, <clears throat> bend your elbow 90 degrees, as if you're about to say goodbye to someone, and then try and pull your hand backwards, and we call this lateral rotation. So imagine you've been held up at a bank, like the stereotypical, you know, arms up, and we put our arms at that, that night, those 90 degree angles. Okay, that's abduction and lateral rotation of the shoulder, and it's the weakest position of the joint. Um, within that, within that joint, we have various ligaments that cross over the humerus to the clavicle to the scapula, which is your shoulder blade, um, and it creates a passive stability, keeps it in place. And the active stability um, is uh, it also is the same muscles that initiate movements, and we call these rotator cuffs, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. The supraspinatus, in particular, is one of those rotator cuffs, and it's located in the upper portion of your scapula on your back. Um, and it only has, uh, in particular, a small gap in between the acromion, which, if you if you put your fingers on your clavicle, your collarbone, and follow it all the way. There's like this little land's end area that feels like your shoulder, but it's like a little hook right at the end, and it drops off. Okay, that's your acromion. Uh, so it has a small gap between the acromion and the humeral head. So the humerus, your upper arm, the bone, as it attaches in, there's this tiny gap that allows for the supraspinatus to go through. And you can imagine the position of these two things is crucial to allow the supraspinatus to do its job. And it does initiate things like abduction and lateral rotation, okay? So bear that in mind. So, as you grab the bar and you bring it down behind your head, you will increase the relative lateral rotation and abduction because of the hyperextension of your cervical spine. So picture pulling that bar down behind your head. What do you have to do with your head? Well, most people would push it forward. Okay, this is a hyperextension of your C-spine. And as that moves forward, the relative position, okay, of your shoulder, okay, moves more into abduction and lateral rotation. So you're, you're further forcing it into deep into its weakest position. Okay, I'm hoping this makes sense. And you're doing all of this under a load. Okay, so your latissimus dorsi wants to then medially rotate and adduct your arm, so the opposite. So it wants to basically bring your arm back into the midline and it wants to take the palm of your hand downwards towards the floor. Imagine you're swimming, it's that. That's what we're talking about. So my point is to resist this, okay, to resist that relative load, it has to increase the load on the supraspinatus in order to maintain your position while simultaneously creating a perfect storm for impingement. So increasing the relative load in that position. Okay, because if the supraspinatus didn't do its job properly, then your arm would just fall forward. Okay, I'm hoping you're with me so far and you can visualize that. So you're pulling the bar down behind your head. If you actually physically do it, if you were listening to this when you're driving, pull over. That's my get out of jail free card. So pull it down behind your head. Your head goes forward. To maintain that position, you have to increase the relative load on your supraspinatus and to be fair, your infraspinatus as well to maintain position. If you didn't, your hands would collapse inwards and posture would go out the window. Okay, your head, as it is hyperextended, stimulates um, a muscle called levator scapulae via muscle spindles. And muscle spindles basically they react to a, um, a speed and length change in the muscle. So imagine I'm driving that load down. I whip my head forward. I stimulate this muscle levator scapulae. 
which you may never have heard about, but you're about to. Okay, it goes from C1 to C4, so the, the these little um, or your cervical spine. <laughs> Yeah, bit of a brain fart. Your cervical spine uh, and inserts itself, so it goes slightly diagonal, inserts itself onto the medial um, superior border of the scapula. So right at the top of your shoulder blade, okay, <clears throat> in basically opposite your thoracic spine. If you put your fingers there, it may feel quite tender and sore, and you may find that that is actually levator scapulae. So when you reach for the bar, the insertion of this muscle, <clears throat> okay, the insertion of this muscle um, is stimulated. Okay, so the insertion is on that scapular border. Okay, it's stimulated. So it's trying to resist my scapula from going into or trying to resist your arm going into that abduction. When you pull the bar concentrically, Okay, most people then push their head forward. And as you push your head forward, you stimulate the muscle spindles. Okay, because you're now putting that muscle on a stretch because your, your neck is moving away from your scapula. So that is a stretch. Okay, so you stimulate that at the origin of levator scapulae. Okay, so you're stimulating it in the neck. I.e., you can see where it's going, pain in the neck. This results in your levator scapula, trying to elevate your scapula, your shoulder blade, and rotates it medially. What this means is, once you've finished, your shoulder, okay, is gonna be in a slightly elevated position. So it's trying to take it out of position, okay? Your neck may feel tight, okay? It may not hurt at this point, but you may start touching your neck and thinking, oh yeah, it feels a bit tight, it feels a bit tender because you're using this muscle in a way it's not really designed for by nature and it doesn't really respond well to, okay? There is, a, there is supposed to be a co-contraction of your mid to lower traps to kind of offset this, but, and there is a but, <clears throat> because of most people loading the bar too much and then driving it down, you whip your head forward, which overstimulates this muscle. So the mid and lower traps, they're, they've ruled out straight away because they can't respond to it, okay? The result over long periods of doing this is hypertrophy of your scalenes and your sternocleidomastoid, fantastic name. And these are muscles on the, the side and front portions of your neck, okay? You'd have to look them up to see them visually. But these can hypertrophy or become bigger and stronger. And they basically pull your head down Okay, towards your clavicle, your your um, your collarbone. Now, this creates then a forward head posture. So imagine your head's drooping forward. Okay, it will create that in the long run. Unfortunately, so we do that. <clears throat> I'm creating the perfect storm for an impingement because now my shoulder is out of position. That gap that the supraspinatus goes through is a lot smaller. So imagine a rope fraying, okay, on a on a frick in a surface with a lot of friction. There's only a certain amount of time it can fray before it snaps, and this is really what we're looking at with this impingement syndrome. So we then go to the bent over row, okay, <clears throat> and with the, the the bent over row, bear in mind we we all, we've already started this process of a forward head posture. Your spine, which you, your head, which is on the top of your spine, starts out in this position. We then place more stress on the thoracic spine. Most notable is C7, T1. So right at the base of your neck, okay, you've got this nice little junction, which you can feel, because it's, it's a bony prominence. So if you go down your neck with two fingers, you'll feel the first major, guess knobbly bit is probably the easiest way of visualizing it that junction there is c71 and it's your cervical thoracic junction so my head's going forward from that position and some people grow a little hunch or a little bump on there so we start this pull movement now 
in order to create this perfect movement, we need to have a degree of shoulder retraction. That's when you pull your shoulders backwards. We need to have arm extension. That's when your arm goes back behind you. Whilst trying to stabilize shoulder girdle elevation, that's when your, your shoulders go towards your ears. And depression, which is the opposite, shoulders going back downwards. <coughs> Excuse me. And then trying to stabilize medial and lateral rotation. So if your arms by your side and your elbows flex to 90 degrees, medial is when your hands come in towards the body. So you rotate from the, the upper arm and lateral is when your arms come out. So we're trying to stabilize all of those whilst pulling. And that's what should happen. So in a bent over position, Okay, you pick up the bar, you roll your shoulders back and down, soft knees hinge forward from the hips. Your spine should have all the natural curves as when you're standing. There shouldn't, you shouldn't be altering or trying to alter in any way. So you should have your, your lumbar curve, your lordotic curve, and you should have your thoracic curve, your kyphotic curve, and your head in a neutral position, as exactly as if you were just standing. When we pull the bar towards the abdomen, okay, the elbow goes through flexion. So you, you start flexing at the elbow. When the elbow gets to your ribs, okay, through that arm extension, we then initiate shoulder retraction, shoulder girdle retraction, and all of these joint actions should then finish together. When we're lowering the bar, the opposite occurs. We start going through shoulder protraction, so shoulder girdle moving forward, arm going into uh, flexion, and elbow going into extension, so your arms are straight at the ends. And again, those movements should finish together. But here's what actually happens. We pick up the bar, <clears throat> shoulders are rounded already. We try and initiate a movement through shoulder retraction first, then arm extension, and then elbow flexion. Okay. We then, unfortunately, develop a shoulder elevation with a cervical extension in our bid to look in the mirror. Please stop looking in the mirror when you're doing a bent over row. It's not good. Everything is thrown out of position. Um, and that's the biggest issue is we create this faulty timing pattern. Okay, this faulty timing pattern. Um, some people can't even retract their shoulder girdle due to a major kyphosis, a major rounding of their shoulders. And in this instance, you will see a rounded back, people trying to pull the bar, but their, their actual back doesn't move. All the movement comes through the arm, arm extension, in fact. Now, here's the issue. If I retract my shoulder to begin the movement, all I'm doing is taking out some major key players okay, from the rest of the movement. So I retract my shoulder, which means my rhomboids, they're done. They're done already. That's their main job. My mid traps and low traps, they're done. And probably a third of my lats, well, they're done as well. So in order to move that load, I've probably got a little bit of lats remaining, but I've got rotator cuffs and I've got posterior delts and I've got my biceps and I've got my forearms and I'm relying on those to lift that weight. Here's the issue. <clears throat> if I'm constantly putting um, my rhomboids, my mid traps and low traps through an isometric contraction under a load, I will develop things like trigger points, which are hyper irritable areas, and these can refer pain. Better yet, better yet, I'm gonna create an overuse injury in my supraspinaeus and my shoulder area because I'm asking them to do most of the load. So what happens is, and you'll see this in people, they have overdeveloped, um, they look like overdeveloped scapula. So you'll see these, these bulging rear, rear delts and you'll see these bulging or hypersensitive um, supra and infraspinatus and you'll see these pop out on the shoulder blades. Okay. But the rest of the back will be relatively out of balance. Okay, This tells me that they're probably pulling incorrectly. Um, better yet, if they've already got rounded shoulders, you'll find that their, their back, Okay, and this is what they'll say, the average gym goer will think, my back is not growing or it's not getting stronger, so I need more weight. And they'll start lifting more weight and jerking that weight around, but because they're not addressing their position, they can't possibly engage those muscles because they're technically then on a stretch. 
And if they're on a stretch, well, they can't be contracting. So what's moving that weight? You can kind of see the, the big issues. So the reason why we work on those joint movements is to initiate the right sequence of muscles in the right position, not only to get results, but to save us from a world of pain in the future. Okay, I'm hoping you're with me so far. So if you can't pull properly in the gym, then you definitely won't pull properly in everyday life. So when I see people on my massage couch, um, they'll, they'll come in and say, there may be a tradesperson, say for instance, electrician, plumber, and they'll say, oh, my, my shoulder hurts. It must be all the, you know, the, the work I'm doing. It, that might be a factor, but I'll often say, okay, you know, we'll go through a, a lifestyle analysis and lo and behold, we'll look at training. And I don't really have to ask sometimes because I can see in their stature, their frame that they work out. And we'll kind of talk about different training. Now I'll get them to just go to one side and I've got like a, just a bar or just a broom handle and I'll get them to show me what bent over row looks like or I'll get them to show me what a shoulder press looks like and so on. And nine times out of 10, I'll spot the faulty timing, the faulty mechanics of that movement. Okay, the hardest thing in that environment is then to retrain that person and send them away. It's far easier for PTs who have um, uh, either a, a diploma in sports massage therapy or something to do hands-on manual therapy okay, during their PT session. Okay, this is why I feel strongly about PTs be, being sports therapists as well. So, as a therapist, okay, when they come to me, this presents like this. They'll often have a persistent neck pain, a dull ache. Imagine the pain scale, so 10 is the worst pain ever, zero is nothing. They'll often say it's a three or four dull ache out of 10, okay? They'll often have a shoulder impingement, and we know it's a shoulder impingement, because if you take your arm, abduct your arm to 90 degrees and then go just slightly higher than that that's really where impingement starts so that's where your supraspinatus might start really pressing against your acromion i can then bring your arm slightly forward so imagine your face is pointed at 12 noon okay if i take your arm to about 2 p.m and i get you to turn your thumb down and apply resistance and there's pain that is a, a special test uh, called empty can uh, which demonstrates a shoulder impingement normally of supraspinatus because you're you're basically put into a position it doesn't like there's pain there it's definitely overworked or impinged so they normally present with an impingement or what they perceive as a restriction in the shoulder and not many people know that if you're pushing and pulling incorrectly, it's not just the muscles you're affecting. You have a capsule that goes around every joint. And this capsule is full of fluid and nutrients and synovial fluid. And you can cr this if you crank up or you change position too much, you can create what we call um, um, a, an adhesive capsule. So the capsule becomes sticky. Okay, the most extreme version of this is frozen shoulder. But that aside, you can create restriction in this capsule so it becomes sticky. Okay, And when I'm testing someone, I can tell if it's capsular or if it's ligament or if it's uh, muscle or not. <clears throat> so as a trained therapist, we can kind of differentiate between all of these. And I will say now, the most common is a sticky capsule. Okay, which we can treat through mobilization and correct techniques. But people often say, yes, they have uh, increased amount of headaches and their breathing will be very inefficient. And I know their breathing's inefficient because I'll just monitor their breathing rate. <laughs> Okay, monitor their breathing rate and it'll be, it'll be very shallow, it'll be very chesty and it'll be higher than it should be. And sometimes I've got a pulse oximeter, so I'll put that on their finger and their, their kind of oxygen capacity, for instance, should be about 98, 99% and I'll see it about 96, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it tells me actually they're, they're just really inefficient at breathing. So we'll work on kind of your diaphragm and, and all of these uh, fantastic muscles. The other, aside to that, the other things that it presents with uh, compression of nerves and blood vessels that supply or innovate your arm. <clears throat> These all come from your C-spine. 
So extreme problems might be things like thoracic outlet syndrome. And in my 15 year career so far, I've seen about seven. Um, so I've seen seven thoracic outlet syndrome. So this is where there's a severe ongoing uh, compression of things. Uh, and we test this from doing a special test, uh, uh, looking at someone's pulse rate, and their pulse rate will tend to disappear. And it tells us there's a severe compression of blood vessels and nerves going on. Their arm will go weak relatively quickly. This is very treatable, but long term uh, can be uh, quite detrimental to someone's health of their upper body and blood vessels. Um, other things, uh, swelling due to, to venous compression. So swelling is normally when you can't clear. So it's more to do with veins and weakness due to nerve compression. So people sometimes go, uh, they do a bench press and their arm goes weak after a while. This tells me a lot that there's a compression within their C-spine. Okay, and they and it, when we're taking kind of a case history, it really guides me on the investigation. So anytime you go and see a therapist, osteopath, physio and so on, really be clear, really give as much information as you can on your on your history. But yeah, if you normally see any of these and people don't link them together, they think, oh, my arm just feels really weak all the time or it feels like a dead arm or it feels fine until I start lifting maybe above my head or I start bench, bench pressing or bent over row. My arm just feels a bit numb sometimes, tingly or just, or just goes weak or it swells and you get kind of more of a compartment syndrome in your forearm so people start you know bicep curling and their forearms swell up and they think they've got weak, weak forearms but actually it's a compression syndrome from their shoulder okay why would you know this but now you do okay now you'll take the steps in order to prevent this from happening so coming back to that seal okay coming back to that seal Remember the seal is the scapula, the nose is the glenoid cavity, and the ball is the glenoid. So if I retract my shoulders, for instance, okay, I fixate my scapula against my thoracic spine. You then prevent the seal from moving. What happens? That's right, the seal can no longer follow the ball. So your chance of joint success, i.e. movement with no injury, drastically decreases. And most people with a shoulder injury, you can normally track back to things like the thoracic spine. The thoracic spine just suddenly doesn't move. So if I've got a really rounded posture, my thoracic spine is going into a hyperextended position, which limits its ability to, to rotate. Okay, And don't get me wrong, it hasn't got extreme rotational capacity, but it's still, still more than the lumbar. Okay, because it's to initiate movement for our shoulder. But if I fixated that, if it hasn't got as much movement, all joints then have to borrow movement from somewhere else. So my thoracic spine doesn't move. The scapula then has to, <clears throat> the scapula has to take up that slack. So that has to move more, which then means the, the humerus, as it attaches into the glenoid uh, fossa, has to move more. And all of this excessive movement leads to instability. You can kind of see the issue there. So every joint is relying on the other for success. Okay, hence why our, our movement timing and our joint position is crucial. But as a therapist, I can treat these. I can treat these through massage, mobilization, and obviously they often have trigger points which we can deactivate, which is quite painful. I'd rather not do that because I can't stand it, to be fair. But these hyper irritable points of contacts called trigger points are there really to, to try and help restrict that movement. They, you know, they wouldn't just suddenly appear. They, they build up or they go to the extreme to try and limit or prevent movement but without re-education of movement as a therapist or if I'm just doing massage I'm just buying you time okay it has to be that treatment with things that you need to take away re-education of movement okay but all of this results in what a therapist may call upper cross syndrome this is then exacerbated by another exercise either completed incorrectly or too much loading and it's called the bench press that's right the bench press and i'm not against the bench press in any stretch of the imagination but 
uh, the amount of people who who excessively load through the bench press like they're going into some powerlifting competition or perform the movement incorrectly uh, boggles the mind and I love that word boggle I was I was so desperate to get into this podcast it boggles the mind um, and just reminds me of that uh, movie um, what's it called Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone <laughs> what's your boggle uh, I'm going off on a tangent sorry um, but yeah you you know you know uh, so your glenohumeral joint is already in the wrong position okay so we we've we may work at a desk all day in a flexed forward rounded posture okay you know the posture you know you're almost collapsing in on yourself losing that fight with gravity you've then done behind the neck lap pull down to exacerbate that position even more you've then gone into a bent over row and you've further exacerbated that position and you're thinking why is my back not growing more weight more weight more weight and we know that's not the answer by now but you know it's Monday and Monday always means chest day and chest day always means bench press so you jump on the bench remember your glenohumeral joints in the wrong position initially anyway from everything that you're doing your shoulder girdle is in a relative protraction as opposed to being pulled back it's rounded and forward your pec major or your pecs as you see them pec major creates arm flexion and allows and along with pec minor causes protraction now one of those joint movements you're already doing so (laughs) there's the issue so if one of these joint joint movements is already happening the muscle is already in a state of minor contraction that's just how your nervous system sees it it's already shortened it's already partially contracting okay so the actin and myosin which are the protein filaments that link to shorten to create muscle contraction are already on their way they're already joining now you grab the bar and you bring it to your chest but my shoulder girdle will not allow retraction so I borrow movement from the arm and the glenohumeral joint. So most of the bench press now comes from arm extension to flexion. In that position, the muscle or muscles get overworked. So they create arm flexion. Yep. What muscles are these? Anterior deltoid and triceps jump in for good measure. Pec major can still do some of the work, but you've probably decreased his efficiency or activity by about a third. So the most often complaint of this, my anterior delt is overdeveloped, or I can really feel this in the front of my shoulder. The front of my shoulder hurts, or I can really feel that in my triceps. Okay, you kind of see what's happening. Or they grip the shoulder straight after the set, they clutch it. And they they give it a little circle, you know, those little circles, you're trying to free it up because it feels tight or it feels restrictive or painful. Correct range of motion and movement with timing are the first things you should work on when lifting. You do not need to bring the bar to your chest. Obviously, it then becomes specific to what you're trying to gain. Are you entering a powerlifting competition? If you are, then yes, you probably need to train with the bar coming to your chest. For everyone else, no, no, you don't. And I'll, and I'll, you can go through this now. And again, if you're driving, please pull over or do this later on. If you put, stretch your arm right in front of you, so you're just stretching it out. Bend your elbow 90 degrees as if you're you're doing a stand up bench press. Pull your arm all the way back. <clears throat> so I want you to visualize you've got a bar in your hand. Take the two fingers of your opposite hand and where you think your anterior deltoid is, push into that area. You will feel that it's quite tough, it's quite bony. Okay. This is your humerus sticking out of the, the, the glenoid fossa, the glenoid cavity. It's sticking out at that position. So if I've got a load and I'm initiating movement, it's not my pecs that are going to initiate that movement. It's everything else. It's the small intrinsic synergist muscles and the fixators like your rotator cuffs. That's the time where you're going to tear something. Okay. That's the time where you're going to overwork something. The actin and myosin don't really start kicking in on the pec until you're just past that. Okay. So... There's no real benefit from bringing the bar to your chest, okay, in terms of muscle building, muscle size, and so on. 
you're just increasing your chance of injury or rotator cuff tear or capsula tear. Okay, you get this thing called a slap lesion. So the point is, don't bring the bar to your chest. Imagine you put your fist on your sternum. Okay, that's the level the bar can come down to. Okay, it won't be detrimental to your training if you don't bring the bar down to there, I promise. Like I said, if you're a power lifter, then you probably do need to bring the bar to your chest because that's part of the competition. But everyone else, why bother? Why bother putting your joint through that load? Okay, remember it's a weak joint. Okay, there's no need to load it like that. I can't emphasize this enough. I'm sure you can gather that. <laughs> so your <clears throat> so correct range of motion, correct timing, these are the first things we should do when we're lifting. Your chance of impingement, neck pain, and lack of results becomes greater and greater. And we haven't even mentioned the rest of your spine, and that's probably for another time, to be fair. I think it's crucial for all PTs to be able to perform some sort of manual therapy. It's crucial that even if you're not a PT, and if you're training in the gym, you work on mobility, correct lifting, pushing and pulling. And if you're unsure, work with someone who knows what they're talking about. This is really important. Because all in all, if I am going into these lifts and my, my shoulder girdle is rounded and forward, and my head posture is forward, you can rest assured that my thoracic spine is going to be locked to some degree in that position. It won't be able to rotate enough. Remember, all joints borrow movement. If my thoracic spine then can't move and my head is in a forward position, so that can't move very well. Lack of movement itself okay creates a perfect storm for impingement and injury let alone the increased load on your thoracic spine or the 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 vertebral discs on your spine you speak to any osteopath and chiropractor about just posture and the spine and they will bore you to tears with it because it's really important but what they don't know what they may not be aware of is the loading the constant loading that people do or the incorrect training techniques that people undergo are the real reasons um, and the real causes of most of those injuries your lumbar spine can't rotate very well okay but it has to increase its range of motion to accommodate the lack of range of motion in the thoracic spine so your chance of lumbar injuries especially l4 l5 increase so that's that real lower back pain and the, these are really important to know because you'll go into training and think it's behind the neck lat pull down but it's not it becomes everything else that you do especially if you're working at a desk Okay, imagine you're working at that desk, you're in that forward flex position, you spend eight, nine hours there, you drive to work in that flex position. Okay, you build up this real flex forward head rounded shoulder posture and you're expecting to go into the gym and it for all to be okay. You then go into a deadlift and the deadlift you're in either in a rounded position or you retract your shoulder girdle straight away. Okay. All of these things together just create that perfect storm that needs to be addressed. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping I've kind of made a case for correct pushing and pulling. Um, in a future episode, I will talk about squats, deadlifts, lunges, and so on in, in a lot more detail. But these are the most common things that I, I've seen. I was in the gym yesterday and I saw all of this in one in one swoop in fact i even saw in this isn't the normal gym i train in i want to make that clear uh but in one of the other gyms that i train in because i get to i get access to a few I, I even saw one of the pts performing some horrendous technique okay obviously it wasn't one of my pts so my pts are trained very highly Okay, I, they know how to assess. They know how to um, make sure that you're the eye for detail. Okay, I can't say that for every PT, but you're well within your rights to research the PT, see what they do, look at the results they get for their clients. Okay, don't be afraid to shop around. The same with therapists. I know I get results for people. 
I know a lot of therapists actually who do the same, who do a beautiful job. But likewise, there's a lot of therapists who maybe they're not sure what they're doing. Uh, and that's okay because <clears throat> they probably won't build up that client base. But anyway, I, you know, go on quite a bit. But I'm hoping that's made it clear. If it hasn't, you can contact me directly via the website. So there's one Zen Academy dot co dot uk or dot com either which i've got both now um and if you go to the contact section on there and contact me with any questions you have uh that would be great obviously please spread the word about these podcasts um i this i am a one-man band i get no funding for this apart from uh, i will name drop him again uh, jez seaton who uh, donated five pounds thank you very much uh that bought me the coffee for today's session <laughs> i joke i don't actually it did buy me the coffee for today's session um so please spread the word i'm relying on you guys for this success i believe in this information for everyone um so spread the word get people to subscribe and give us a five star rating as we're competing with some very big guns um and yes have a great day my name's been kieran and i think it still is enjoy the rest of your day Thanks for listening to the One Zen Fitness Academy podcast. Make sure that you subscribe. Please give us a five-star review. And please, if it's not too much trouble, write review. For more information, go to www.onezenacademy.com for all your fitness, wellness, and health needs. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.